So uh, welcome everybody again uh, back to the summit and we'd like to welcome uh, Professor Akihito Watanabe. Um, he's, uh, he was born and raised in the Philippines, uh, received his uh, Occident, uh, university degree at the Occidental College, the Bachelor of Arts and uh, graduated from Univ uh, Yale University with a PhD uh, in the United States. After teaching in Kentucky, Washington State, California for several years, he came to Japan, the country of his citizenship, to continue his career in research and education at Otsuma's Women's University, where he is currently professor in the Department of Comparative Culture. His academic spe speciality is in classical studies, and his current research focuses on the reception of Japanese information in early modern European Latin literature. He's also been active in Japan, Greece, cultural exchange, and in 2019, served as a group leader of the Japanese government cabinet office international youth development exchange index program to the Philippines and Vietnam. Uh, he has a native to near fluency in Japanese and English and is competent in Latin, Greek and German. He currently lives in Yokohama with his spouse, two children and one dog. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So, um, yes, okay. thank you for the kind introduction. Um, so, should I begin? Yes, please, please begin, yeah. Okay, um, yes, thank you. Um, so, um, yes, I wish you a great morning to uh, all of you here. Uh, first of all, I want to thank our great organizer, Neil Day, and all the assistants for making this event possible. I also uh, want to thank you all for being here. And most of all, I thank God for this wonderful day and hour. Before I begin, a word about the title. As the time for this talk came closer, I looked at the title I had first submitted and in view of recent events, thought that I should perhaps add a couple of expressions to make it a little clearer in light of what is happening now. The added words are in brackets. In the past few months, the crises of the world have unfortunately multiplied, but these events come after a series of many other grave trials that have faced humankind, well, that have faced us in the past. Pandemics have come and gone, and the current one would surely be followed by others, thus the addition of current. And we have, since February this year, been hearing about another crisis, a war in Europe, a war that also affects those ethnic groups and regions that have played such a prominent role in the history of the Christian church. These are world crises of which I, and probably many others, have heard forewarnings in the church as well as in other places. I clearly remember actually uh, hearing in a church late last year that the Third World War had already started. And this was not any internal voice, uh, mind you, but was said uh, in a sermon by a priest who is from one of those countries quite close to this conflict. So to make clear that I'm referring to such global events, and not to more local crises, let us say, in my family, though there are also many of them every day, uh, let me assure you, um, I made the second edition in the PowerPoint title. So today, um, excuse me, I need to turn the slide, yes. So today, um, I will look at stories of several Christian families that have faced historical crises involving both their faith and the well-being of communities around them. These stories come from a wide range of periods and countries, from Italy at the height of the Roman Empire to Japan in the early 17th century. I choose these stories because I have dealt with them in my work as a researcher in the humanities investigating martyr stories from early modern Japan looking at both precedents that inspired them, as well as their later transmissions and retellings in faraway places, including Europe. 
I will also speak about my own experience as a spouse and father of two children living right here in Japan in these turbulent times. Now, let me say a little about myself. I am a supernumerary member of Opus Dei, meaning that I live out in the world with a worldly job and the worldly, though nowadays perhaps not so common, status of a husband living together with his spouse, daughter, and a son. As a supernumerary member, I do not reside in any of the so-called centers or houses of the work, but attend meetings and one regularly for the continuous formation that I believe we all need. This is, of course, all in addition to attending the celebrations and other events at my parish church in the Yokohama Diocese. I'm very glad to be able to say honestly that Opus Dei, or the work, as we often call it, has helped me learn the priceless faith traditions of our church and uh, has also helped me in trying to apply them, you know, the teachings of the church, in the professional, social, and private spheres of my life. Though this is not to say that there are no challenges in these spheres or that I don't sometimes, or rather often, struggle trying to find, uh, for example, you know, what to confess about and uh, you know, examinations of conscience and so forth, and face a myriad other issues. But it is a great consolation to find that I'm not alone, well, that you know, we are not alone in this fight to have the company of a great army of brothers and sisters, past and present, all around the world. In my professional work, which for a super, supernumerary member like me, is an important, though not the most important part of one's life, I am a teacher and researcher in the humanities specializing in classics. That is to say, the ancient Greek and Roman tradition and you know, languages and literature and so forth. This was, you know, this Greco-Roman tradition, uh, this was in its beginnings most definitely a pagan tradition, yet one that eventually merged with Judeo-Christian culture in the fertile and forgiving soil of Europe, as I always like to emphasize to my students. My current research is focused on so-called Neo-Latin, that is to say the quasi-classical Latin literature that flourished after the Middle Ages, mostly in Europe. And in this large body of texts, I concentrate especially on those texts that deal with Japan. As some of you perhaps know, but others perhaps do not, and thus may be surprised to hear it, an enormous amount of fairly learned Latin documents, both in print and in manuscript, have been sitting largely unexamined in libraries and archives around the world, and not a small part of it is connected with uh, non-classical, non-European subjects such as Japan. But I will say more about um, all of this later. Um, as this summit is uh, partly, well, or at least mostly, um, about our turbulent times, let me also mention this particular situation that took place in my family during the pandemic. When news about it was just emerging from China, I was very busy preparing for a sabbatical year to be spent in Vienna, Austria, a 12 month stay, you know, as we all thought, um, in, this very, in this still very Catholic city, not only for myself, but also for my wife, children, and our little Maltese dog. I still vividly recall how I went on a scouting trip, so to speak, in the February of 2020 to look for a place for our family to live in when everyone, including myself, was still incredulous about this rumored health emergency in some remote corner of China. For part of this stay in February, 
I joined a conference field trip in which people were happily eating together in closed rooms and talking loudly and so forth, uh, all without masks, of course. The famous Vienna Opera Ball was also taking place um, at that time. The very last, it turned out, before the pandemic interruption. Well, uh, the rest is history, as they say. And in April, we did not make it to Vienna as planned, at least not together. I managed to obtain a visa to enter Austria in the summer and ended up mostly staying there until February 2021. During the seven months of stay, much of it in a city under a strict lockdown, I did manage to make progress in my research, as I will discuss later. However, my family and our dog ended up not joining me, and this caused not a small amount of, uh, uh, of hardship to all of us. At the same time, though, for myself, at least, the spiritual direction and other support I continue to receive from my brothers in the work, as well as other members of the Viennese uh, Catholic community, including the Japanese uh, society or the Japanese Agemeinde, were of immense, really crucial help. So today, um, I will speak about three crises, two of them historical and one current. The earliest is from the 2nd to 6th century AD, the period of anti-Christian uh, you know, persecution, followed by anti-Orthodox or anti-Catholic persecutions um, in the ancient Mediterranean. Then I will turn to the 16th to 17th century, when our church was engaged on multiple fronts, ranging from Europe to right here in Japan. And uh, lastly, I will look at our present times, especially but not only the uh, past tumultuous two to three, two to three years. In past crises, we can see Christian families whose members inspired and protected each other spiritually, if not physically. They all faced their particular challenges in balancing their faith against social surroundings that were often hostile to the church, and they ultimately chose the former when a choice was really forced on them. We can also see how the families in the past have always been conduits of religious ethics, a locus of educational apostolate, as it were, where they learned from and adapted existing traditions to their own unique situations. All of this, I would say, suggests that we too ought, ought and can learn from these and other uh, stories of families weathering the storm while we face our own challenges, which are different, but no less daunting or exciting than those of the past. Now, um, let me turn to two martyrs and their families from antiquity. The first, Saint Felicitas of Rome, is perhaps to be put under the category of legendary figures. Though her persecutor, the philosopher emperor, Marcus Aurelius, was definitely uh, uh, real, yeah, uh, you know, historical character. In any case, at least, the uh, starting in the Middle Ages, Um, we do have the story of Saint Felicitas, a pious mother and citizen of Rome, who was taken before the famous emperor and threatened together with her seven sons with dire consequences unless she apostatized. The, uh, the martyr accounts 
uh, sorry, uh, the martyr can't say that her sons were tortured and killed in front of her one by one, and that she was martyred as the very last. Um, the story does follow the pattern of the more famous one of the mother and her seven sons in 2 Maccabees 7, which takes place during the anti-Jewish persecution instigated by the Hellenistic Greek king Antiochus Epiphanes IV. Now, as a scholar of antiquity, I myself would say that historical evidence in the strictly academic sense about the existence of Saint Felicitas and her children would seem uh, rather vague, and that taking a secular view, one might be tempted to see her account as a late antique to early medieval fiction patterned on the episode in the Maccabees. As with many of the uh, yeah, wondrous, miraculous hagiographical accounts, however, there are also no conclusive indication as to Saint Felicitas' non-existence either, and there are also many sites and, rel and relics associated with her and her family. And what matters, after all, is that their story has inspired countless generations afterwards, as we shall see. Now, um, by the way, is everything going on, on okay, Neil? Yeah, everything's good. Yeah, all good. Yeah, oh, good. Yeah, good. Thank you. Yes, I just wanted to check. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, the other ancient figure I bring up is securely attested. This is Boethius, whose very learned works are extant and allow us to characterize him in all fairness as one of those intellectual giants of late antiquity on par with Augustine, Jerome, and many others. Boethius, indeed, and a host of other authors from around the 4th to 6th century AD amply demonstrate that, contrary to the common idea of intellectual and cultural decline, going hand in hand with the fall of the Roman Empire and the spread of Christianity, this was a period that easily surpassed the classical eras of Greece and Rome in broad synthesis as well as depth of analysis. Boethius, furthermore, belonged to an illustrious family of nobles and was related in marriage to the Simmachi, another elite, li elite lineage, one of whom, as prefect of Rome, helped the young Augustine reach the pinnacle of his career as the orator of Milan. He and his family and relatives show that wealth, prestige, and top-notch learning sometimes went together back then, uh, which is something that you know, happens all too rarely uh, today. Boethius's final fate, which was to be executed by the command of the Arian heretic King Theodoric in 524, also makes him a Christian mar martyr and a saint. A major reason behind the execution was Boethius's alleged attempt to bring the Greek Eastern and Latin Western clergy closer together, which also should inspire many of us to pray for his intercession to prevent and heal all schisms inside our church. He was also a father of two sons who followed in his footsteps. Um, to become prominent politicians you know, later on. His father-in-law, implicated in his fall and executed shortly later, was likewise not only a politician, but also someone active in serving the church. Thus, Boethius too can be shown to have been a martyr and a Christian parent, a heroic member in his own family, as well as in the wider health uh, wider faith community. Let us now uh, yeah, jump forward about one millennium to another part of the globe, the Japanese archipelago right here in East Asia. Japan came to be known only rather vaguely uh, to the Christian West in the 14th century, thanks to Marco Polo, 
But we can surely thank divine providence that in the mid 16th century, probably just a few years after the first Portuguese merchants began to arrive here, Saint Francis Xavier himself, the patron saint and apostle of the Far East, landed on our shores. The date on which he landed, August the 15th, um, is of course one of the holiest days of the Christian calendars, both East and West. And August 15th, 1549, you know, the date he landed on Kagoshima, was also exactly the 15th anniversary of the founding of the Jesuit order in Paris, presided over by none other than Saint Ignatius Loyola, of which Xavier II was present. Uh, you know, at, at which event uh, Xavier II was present, I was going to say, sorry. Um, on the so-called Christian century, which lasted until the mid 1600s, during which the proportion of Catholics in Japan probably reached a peak that has not been seen again to this day, before they were scattered and driven underground by savage persecutions. Um, you know, on this period, much has been lit, written, and I will not spend much time repeating what has been said by others so well, and what has been written by others so well. Um, those who want to know the most current state of academic knowledge on this subject should read, for example, the Jesuit father and scholar Antoni Usler's the, the Samurai and the Cross, which came out just this year, or the Encyclopedia Hidden Christian, uh, Hidden Kirishtan, sorry, of Japan Illustrated, uh, which is no, in, in Japanese, it's uh, Sen Senfuku Kirishitan Zufu. Um, published in 2021. I just want to say that from a secular or even Protestant viewpoint, it is so easy, uh, so tempting to present the story as one of mistaken ambition and abject failure, and to say that the missionaries were first lured by the unsettled fractious state of Japan and made some spectacular in inroads among us, you know, the Japanese, of all classes who were thirsty for a new religion, but that they were then driven back by a combination of hostile forces, consisting not only of powerful Japanese rulers like uh, Iyasu and, uh, you know, and uh, Hideyoshi and so forth, and their Buddhist advisors, but also non-Catholic Westerners, principally the British and the Dutch who succeeded in dislodging and replacing the Portuguese and Spanish traders. This is the usual story um, already told in Europe as early as the mid 17th century. And this is also um, perhaps uh, from a modern standpoint, um, the fairest and safest interpretation to give in a strictly uh, secular setting. But whatever the motivations of principal players, it is also a widely attested and acknowledged fact that hundreds and thousands of believers, all the way from some of the highest ranked Western missionaries, um, even the Bishop of Japan, as well as uh, Japanese people of both samurai and commoner class were martyred all over our country, from Nagasaki in the south to Tohoku in the north. The martyrs, of course, and their martyrdom may be scandals and foolishness to the Gentiles, but they are heroes and victors to us, our spirit, spiritual forefathers who show us the path of true faith. Among the many martyrs at this time were members of the Honda family of Arima. Um, let me turn here. Oops, no, I should, sorry, turn back here. Um, of which more will be said later. It is also an established fact that some communities of hidden believers managed to pass on certain elements of their faith through family kinship and other local networks, all the way to the reopening of Japan in the Meiji period. The memories of these tenacious and for us truly heroic and inspiring believers have continued to reverberate around the world for close to four centuries now, as we shall see. 
let us now fly um, our way back or no, our way away, so to speak, um, to Europe, to Germany this time in the early 17th century and specifically to the city of Koblenz. The reason why this locality is mentioned will come up a bit later, so uh, please be patient. The name Koblenz comes from the Latin word confluentia or confluentes, meaning the confluence of rivers, the Rhine and the Moselle in this case. Both are important economic arteries and the Rhine has also served as the natural boundary between the Germanic tribes and their neighbors to the southwest. It was probably near Koblenz that Julius Caesar built his famous bridge in just 10 days in order to send his troops to ancient Germania and wreak havoc there. Koblenz started out as, and until recently it has been, a military outpost held by the Romans, Germans, the French, and sometimes even more exotic groups like the Swedes or even the Americans. I took the photograph on the slide um, in the summer of 2020 from the Ehrenbreitstein fortress overlooking the city from across the Rhine, which was once also a residence of the Archbishop of Trier. In the early to mid 17th century, just as open Catholic evangelization in Japan was slowly coming to its fiery end, the area around Koblenz, as well as much of Europe, became the battleground of the Thirty Years' War. Now, the Thirty Years' War was uh, such a huge mess, I would say, of uh, full of bizarre and tragic developments that it makes the two world wars, not to speak of the current conflict in Ukraine, seem simple and tame in comparison, uh, though of course I don't mean to uh, belittle any of the latter. This Europe-wide conflagration, the Thirty Years' War, that is ostensibly started out as a struggle between Catholic and Protestant states, but soon came to include much backstabbing among supposed allies, as well as secret and not so secret alliances across denominations, reminds us also that the anti-Christian persecution in Japan was not happening in isolation, but was part of a global socio-religious political upheaval. And I have found ample evidence that people at that time, you know, in the 17th century already, uh, were actually quite aware of this wider picture. So uh, in Koblenz in 1625, and this city being dragged deeper into this colossal mess, the local Jesuit school as a theme for its annual theatrical performance in front of um, the Archbishop and the dignitaries of the Rhineland Palatinate chose the Martyrs of Japan. Until a few years ago, this play had lain all but forgotten in a state archive in Koblenz. The manuscript recording it has been, uh, well, had been actually uh, cataloged over 100 years ago, but the text was misidentified as two separate plays instead of one, and no one had made any serious effort to record and analyze its contents, which is not surprisingly, uh, which is perhaps not too surprising since there are tens of thousands of Latin plays like this actually um, scattered all across Europe. With the help of many learned colleagues, I have been able to locate these manuscripts, record and compare their contents, and identify the Japanese story on which the play was based. During my, st my stay in Austria in the middle of the pandemic, I have, also, I have also been able to consult with experts there and elsewhere to develop some idea of the political and cultural context in which the play was written and staged. The text of this play and of another piece staged in uh, Munich, which you know, uh, is also based on events in Japan, will be published soon, or rather has just been published uh, in Britain together with English translation commentary and introduction. So uh, the cover of this book is on the slide and you know, this is as a bit, as a small bit of an advertisement. 
Um, the protagonists of the Koblenz play are Honda Thomas Hebioe, a Catholic samurai, um, his brother Matthias, and Thomas's children Eustus and Jacobus, all martyred in Arima near Nagasaki in 1613. That is just 12 years before the story was staged in Koblenz in you know, 1625. 1613 was also a time when the then decade old Tokugawa government was consolidating its control across the country, you know, across Japan, and gearing up to throttle the Catholic community around Nagasaki. The Arima family ruling the homonymous domain, which had initially been Catholic, but was then being run by an apostate ruler, cooperated with Ieyasu and his Nagasaki agent, Hasegawa Fujihiro, to uh, weaken and eventually eradicate the faith community and its realm. The 1625 Koblenz play features Fujihiro and Ieyasu himself as major protagonists and explores, sometimes with surprising level of accurate detail, the forces that drive as well as resist religious persecutions. Iyasu in this play appears as a reluctant persecutor, a supreme ruler who would personally rather not, actually not hurt his subordinates or exterminate their families because of their private beliefs, but is persuaded that it is ultimately necessary to do so for the safety of all of Japan, um, and he is you know, instigated by the magistrate of Nagasaki, who is presented as the agent of the devil that is intent on destroying uh, the Catholic community all the way from Britain to Japan. Honda Thomas and his equally steadfast brother, uh, Matthias, are first caught by Fujihiro and are assassinated. Then the two children of Thomas, Justus and Jacobus, are interrogated at length in front of Ieyasu, who employs both threats and enticements to make them apostatize and thus preserve the noble Honda family for the realm. The two boys, however, follow firmly in the footsteps of their father and uncle, never stop not only preserving their faith, but even trying to teach others, uh, including Iyasu himself, um, the superiority of Catholic doctrines. And in the end, uh, the two children are beheaded, um, you know, uh, at the conclusion of this play, actually. As to be expected, the play takes a certain degree of liberty with known history, such as the prominent appearance of Ieyasu, who does not actually play an active part in the original martyr story, um, as reported from Japan. But the martyrdom of the Honda family did, as far as we can determine, follow the general outline sketched above, and it is quite remarkable how a historical Japanese event was represented on stage a little more than a decade after it actually happened in faraway Germany, in Latin, in front of local dignitaries, including the powerful archbishop. While studying the text of this play, I have noticed numerous parallels with existing Jesuit plays about St. Felicitas and Boethius, along with many others dealing with both Christian and pagan subjects. Like other Jesuit Latin plays of this period, this piece uses the language and format of a long European theatrical tradition that goes back through Roman drama to ancient Greek tragedy. As a production of a Jesuit school, one of the educational objectives of such a play was to teach the pupils the classical tradition up to the point where they could think and act like mythical Greco-Roman heroes but tempered also with current Catholic and Western European ethics. While the uh, pupils and teachers of Koblenz were preparing for this production, which by the way must have lasted a few hours and also featured much, much uh, spectacle, including music and uh, you know, witches flying on broomsticks, they clearly consulted existing plays about family martyrs. 
Through my investigation, I could demonstrate that they used the printed plays of the French Jesuit father and confessor to King Louis the, uh, thir the 13th, um, who was called uh, Nicolas Cosan, and uh, that they dealt, uh, and these, uh, you know, and the plays of Cosan um, dealt with the martyrdoms of Saint Felicitas, Boethius, and their families. Many lines showcasing the Christian family supporting each other to face and overcome trials imposed by mistaken rulers, as well as those expressing the sentiments of apparently reasonable, yet ultimately narrow and intolerant secular leaders are reused in the Koblenz play. The Japanese martyrs shown in Koblenz 1625 thus stands at a confluence of lessons flowing from diverse origins, that is to say, Greco-Roman, early Christian, Japanese, etc., for the benefit of the actors and the audience of a community facing a very difficult and complicated situation of their own. The early Christians faced their own challenges the 16th to 17th century Catholics around the world, those of other kinds, and we have a yet different set of trials. Compared to plagues and wars of the past centuries, the ones afflicting us today may seem to be of smaller scale, but they may be at the beginning stages, um, and we have to, of course, be vigilant about the psychological challenges they may cause to younger people, which may already be considerable. The pandemic since late 2019 has created much disruption in societies and may have worsened cracks that have existed all around the world. I was in Europe in late 2020 to early 2021 and saw up close how strict lockdowns and protests against them drove many citizens to you know, quite a high degree of uh, stress and anger. Um, things may have been quieter in Japan, where I spent most of 2021 in another series of uh, lockdowns. But this is not to say that large and important segments of the population did not feel a great deal of pain and frustration also. Then we got the war in Ukraine, of which we had many forebodings before this year, and which with some justification could be said to have started you know, actually in 2014 or even before. As someone getting close to the age of 50, who grew up in the Philippines and saw uh, coup d'etats with my own eyes, um, I like to tell younger people, including my children, certainly, that wars are unfortunately nothing new, that they have in fact been, you know, palpably increasing around the world in the last decade or so, especially in those places where, where citizens of richer countries have tended not to notice, and that they often have complex backgrounds and causes that cannot be understood immediately. Together with my son, as well as the global Catholic community and beyond, including those of the Eastern Orthodox traditions, I pray every day for peace and justice to return to Ukraine. But for us living in this country, perhaps a greater challenge is, simply put, secularization or um, you know, we can also talk about the anthropological crisis that uh, Father Calloway has mentioned. Um, now, I'm neither a theologian nor a sociologist. I'm simply someone who has dealt with the history of the world, especially of the ancient Mediterranean, but also of other periods and areas as a researcher and teacher, and have been living and working here in Japan for the last 10 years. But to me, the degree to which the supramaterial and suprahuman, you know, that is to say things you know, above this material world, you know, above the human world, you know, the spiritual realm, uh, the degree to which you know, this kind of thing has been uh, banished from societal consciousness 
in many of the so-called uh, first world countries, but perhaps especially in Japan, and especially in, in urban areas like Tokyo, possibly unparalleled in world history. Even today, of course, conditions are said to be quite different in certain areas of the world where one can actually be killed you know, for professing our faith. Um, in our world where we live in, profession of faith may be but may be met with you know, more like strange looks, avoidance of personal contact, fewer professional opportunities, fear of eventual social and economic hardship and so forth, rather than with bullets, the, gu the guillotine or the literal cross. But when they keep piling on, this kind of soft persecution of or soft pressure may be as effective as the more physical ones of the past at least in making us more lukewarm and secular so that we eventually forget rather than actively abandon what our faith commands. I do, however, believe that the current trend of secularization and the idolatry of man and material will eventually give way, as we humans are ultimately not made for this goal, however strong the forces are that try to drag us this way. Even in my job teaching in a non-Christian, all-female school, well, except for you know, faculty like myself, um, even you know, in my setting, I do have encounters, I think, with those who intrinsically get the sense of what I have just said, even though I cannot say it too you know, clearly or repeatedly in a strictly secular educational setting. And those who do not get it may you know, do so eventually, later in their lives. Um, in my own family, too, I would say that there are times when the seeds I sow seem to be taken up immediately, and there are other times when they seem to fall on hard rocks or otherwise get lost. And uh, doubtless, many seeds are also you know, thrown on me and also do get lost. Uh, and I have to you know, be mindful of that always. Um, yeah, for a bit of uh, personal detail, let me mention that um, also my you know, wife is, uh, my spouse is uh, unbaptized. My daughter is baptized, but she sometimes, gone to, uh, she sometimes goes to a Protestant church together with my in-laws. Uh, my, my son is baptized and has received First Communion, but is uh, sometimes rather busy with uh, you know, the education and cram schools and so forth. So uh, the challenge of secularization is very much in my immediate family as well. Um, and I have like five minutes, right? Yeah. Still. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, as uh, time and occasion permits, I try to relay what fruits of formation I can think of to my family and, of course, to others around me. In the current pandemic also, uh, family definitely has been a place of refuge for all of us, and we hope it will continue to be this way. We should all be thankful that we do not have to wear masks in our homes, uh, well, at least not most of the time, unless one of us demonstrably you know, contracts the virus, which has also happened to us. Um, and uh, let me come to uh, the conclusion now. Um, let me see. Let me turn to here. Yes. Now, um, yes, to uh, come to a conclusion, yes, um, I, I do believe that uh, the kind of secularism, you know, or the anthropological crisis that has become widespread in the last few decades and you know is quite widespread right now uh, i do believe that that kind of trend uh you know that does seem to be strong but ultimately that it cannot last in this way uh, because it has no proper understanding not only of god and the good but also of you know the devil or the bad uh, this kind of secularism has no sense of the suprahuman and supramaterial world, you know, the ultimate good that really drives us, nor does it seem to have an inkling of the pervasive, ever-mutating evil 
that has from time immemorial tried to bring us down. I cannot say that I comprehend these vast forces myself, you know, perfectly either, but looking at various phases of human history with senses honed by the teachings of the church, one begins to vaguely see not only the many instances of the good inspiring individuals, but also the extremely powerful forces of evil that often lure people even under the guise of good. So in my project studying the Koblenz play and similar pieces, I've seen how tales of families passing on the teachings of the church across generations and resisting persecutions together have provided inspirations throughout the centuries in many parts of the world. By the way, it may come as a surprise, uh, but is actually you know, true that in ancient Greek and Latin, there are no words that correspond exactly to our concept of family. The Latin familia actually means household, including slaves, etc. And the modern Greek world for family, which is uh, ecogenia, is not really attested in antiquity, you know, in, in ancient Greek texts. The Sino-Japanese word kazoku also does not mean to have been used in this sense until the Meiji period. Uh, from all of this, there are you know, people who would today say that uh, the family also is a modern construct that um, you know, like race and the biological sex, um, it has no natural trans-historical basis and that it should be relegated you know, to the dustbin of history, like so many other terms that writing that uh, right-wing politicians nowadays like to use. Um, but uh, from what I've said, I think you can understand that I do not agree with this uh, kind of opinion. Um, and um, you know, as a scholar of ancient Greece and Rome, um, I can see that the family has no exact equivalent in the vocabulary of their languages, but I can, I can also cite countless examples of devotions of parents to their children and children to their parents. And, um, you know, really strong marital unions also, not only from the Christian, but uh, even the pagan period. So um, let me conclude very briefly. In this talk, we have seen how family has been a vehicle for religious tradition since antiquity. Family and apostolate are also linked in the sense that exemplary Christian parents and children have continued in Catholic literature, including the scripture, but also things like dramatic productions. And uh, doubtlessly, you know, this the examples of Christian families have inspired people in real life also so many times. Um, and uh, these examples, you know, have inspired others to follow in their footsteps and face their own unique challenges by adapting lessons learned from previous generations or even nations far removed. So uh, the lessons of Catholic families should and will surely inspire us also to overcome our challenges, however new or strange or daunting they are. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Watanabe. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And uh, people are raising their hands in appreciation. Um, so now we have uh, just to open up for any uh, questions. Um, Perhaps, uh, Father, uh, sorry, uh, Professor, Professor Watanabe, you might yes. want to um, oh. we can stop the share screen. Yeah, stop so the share screen. Yes, I will yeah, do that. That's, mm -hmm. Yeah, here we go. Great. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, now, mm -hmm. so I'd like to welcome, if there's anybody with any uh, questions, uh, yes. there's a few hearts. And, uh, yes, and I, I'd be glad to answer you know, either in English or Japanese. Okay. Uh, yeah, Nihongo ka ego de mo. Nihongo de mo. Okay. Okay. Um, I just one question myself, Professor mm -hmm. Watanabe. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Being uh, in it from an, uh, antiquity, mm -hmm. saying that the the family has always been that protective unit, uh, mm -hmm. in spite of persecutions and difficult mm -hmm. times, mm -hmm. whether physical or whether in, even in fact uh, through pandemics. And mm -hmm. uh, but when the actual attack today is mm -hmm. on the family, 
the mm-hmm. actual secular world has targeted mm-hmm. the family because it's realized the mm-hmm. family has been the bulwark, the protector mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. society. Mm-hmm. And I think the attack seems to be now focused not so much on external things, but actually breaking down the meaning of father, breaking down the meaning mm-hmm. of mother. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in mm-hmm. that context, with the attack on the family, how do you see the future going or, or what can we do to mm-hmm. protect against such attack? Mm-hmm. So, um, so I just, uh, mm-hmm. uh, just knew yes. what I so, mm. uh, uh, yes, thank you. Well, um, mm, may, maybe because I am, well, maybe because I spend most of my time in Japan and, uh, you know, I've also been to other Asian countries like the Philippines. Um, I'm actually maybe somewhat more optimistic, you know, than many people in the U.S., for example. Um, and um, like even within Europe, however, you see, you know, pushbacks like in Italy, you know. The um, new uh, prime minister, um, her name is Meloni, I think Georgia Meloni, you know, has uh, talked so much about family. And, uh, you know, of course, you know, like, like being, a politi- being, being a politician, one has to, you know, like so, say so many things and, you know, and, uh, you know, go with so many sides that, you know, of course, like I, I don't agree with you know everything that you know her her government or you know yeah. other governments like hers stand for. However, we, we do see, you know, um, even leaders of countries in Europe um, taking the side of the family quite firmly, and uh, also, you know, the the, the kind of um, you know um, forces trying to dismantle the family, you know, and so forth. Um, it, it hasn't reached Japan so strongly, I would say, I would think, yeah. you know, with, with such great strength. Um, and, and, and though, of course, you know, we have our own challenges. And and also, I mean, of course, um, we have to guard, in, in some sense, um, yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry to like uh, go on another track, but uh, we, we also have to, you know, guard against the family sometimes becoming too strong or you know like an impervious wall, right? Mm. Uh, I think the family has to, you know, has to adapt to some degree, you know, to social conditions. Like uh, if it's if it doesn't change at all, you know, that that is really da- that is really dangerous because um, you know it, it's like a, it's like a tree that doesn't bend, right? Mm. Yeah, it, it can break. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, I think, uh, you know, uh, so, so I'm somewhat more optimistic and uh, I, I think we can really, you know, teach others by example, you know, like, um, you know, and um, also not, you know, insist on, let us say, turning back the clock all the time, you know, like, like we don't, we don't want to bring like some of the, you know, older, really, you know, so- sometimes rather selfish father figures of the past, you know, yeah. like, uh, like, like in traditional Japan, yeah, sometimes this has happened also, you know, uh, like this father of whom, you know, like everyone in the family is really afraid, you know, we don't, we don't want to bring back that, yeah. that kind of family, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, no, so, yeah. So I think we can adapt and uh, we can also yeah, continue to learn from history, but also, you know, have historical consciousness, see how the modern period is different from the past, but not always in a bad way. Yeah. 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 So uh, you're in, in, have a, a kind of a positive uh, view in in spite of the attacks in, in general. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. good. Uh, are, are there any other uh, questions from anybody? Anybody like to pose a question or raise a hand? See hearts flying. Mm-hmm. 
。中身さん、ご質問あれば、なんか今チャンスありますね。Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm sorry to see that now that maybe I spoke too fast so that there was some uh, uh, some issues with the、uh, translation. There's lots of hands and hearts raising, so. <laughs>、um. mm-hmm. Yeah, well,、um, since there's some time, like, what, what, what do you think about? You know, like、um, maybe because maybe I haven't you know understood your question、uh, perfectly, Neil. Well, like, it's just、uh, it, yeah, the Euro. I come from Europe, and、uh, mm-hmm. Ireland is very has had been very Catholic country,、mm-hmm. um, and you know there has been many attacks on t- traditional mm-hmm. Mm-hmm.、Uh, family and. Things become very progressive. So,、mm-hmm. Ireland,、uh, it's it, 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 I, I wonder if St. Patrick would view Ireland. I think <laughs> we need a、mm-hmm. second St. Patrick in Ireland. So,、mm-hmm. just, with, the, with the difficulties、um, mm-hmm. in modern world,、mm-hmm. not only economic, but also spiritual attack, I, I think,、mm-hmm. was it Pope Leo the 13th that said, had it, this vision、mm-hmm. that Satan would be.、Um, Become more strong the next hundred years after,、mm-hmm. after Pope、uh, Leo the 13th,、mm-hmm. and that the family would be under increasing attack. And it just seems、mm-hmm. to be so, yeah.、Mm-hmm. Yeah.、Um, yeah. I've never been to Ireland.、Um, I, I, yeah. I wish I could go there. But yeah, I mean, I, I do know that、uh, yeah, in places like Italy, you know, Austria also. Yeah, the family has been attacked. But、um, but as I, as I said, yeah, it's also inspiring to see, you know, in countries like Italy and Hungary, you know, the leaders of these countries are. You know, that's really, true. You know, yeah, families, that's true.、Right? Do, do you think, do you think、uh, in Asia, the family has been traditionally very strong、mm-hmm. um, and that it can resist those t y p e of forces? Be、mm-hmm. better than in Europe? Um, yeah, I, yeah, I think, I think so, yes. And,、um, you know, like, I, I get a sense that in Japan,、um, they are, I mean, there, there has been this other kind of problem, you know, the, the, like the father who is too tyrannical. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that kind of thing. Like, in the you know, like I, I hear stories from the 50s and the 60s, you know, of、um, yeah, these、uh, you know, fathers who you know, e- either yeah, try, try to rule a family with, a, with, a iron, with an iron fist, you know, or sometimes they are completely absent and you know, just、um, you know, like give money to the family.、Um, I, I think we, we don't want to you know, have that kind of family either. Yeah, so、mm-hmm. there's a, a question here, and、um, we're Uh, professor, that you might see in the Q. Can you see that yourself in the QA? Or the QA?、Uh, yes. Yeah. And it's. Oh, oh okay.、Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, Nihongo, uh, so, so maybe I'll answer this in Japanese. Yeah, please. Yeah.、Uh, yeah. Hi, hi. So、uh, maybe if you could uh, uh, read the question from the QA and then、uh, post the answer. Yeah. Yes, えっとですね、えー、オプスデイでの要請は、えーまあ、あの私のお父さんとしての役割にどんな影響を与えていますかと、えーまあ、そうですね、あのまあ、例えば、えーまあ、罪の、まあそうですねまあ、罪の概念とか、えー、とですね、あと、えーまあ、国会ですね、あの国会の秘跡、あの許しの秘跡。の、えー、重要性っていうのもあのよく、まああのね、あのオプスではあの教えられるんですけれどもあのな,なんか私の,あのちょ私の息子もな,なぜか最近そのなんか自分は悪いなんか人間だとか何、えー、て言うんですかねなんかどうしな,なんていうのかなそのなんか自分はすごい悪い人間だけどこれからどうしようみたいな。なんかその、なんていうんですかね、なんかそれは心配だっていうようなことを言い出したので、えー、まあ私もそのね、ああのそんな心配することはないと、ですね、あのちゃんと、まあ、機会があったら許しの指摘を受けて、あのね、あとまあ神様に信頼して
あの行けばいいっていうようなことを言ったりしたんですけれども、まあ、まあそういったレベルでのこう細かい、なんていうんですかね、あのまあ、教会の教えを、えー、より、あなんていうんですかね、まあ、細やかにあの家族に伝えることができるかなと、えーまあ、いうようなことと、まあ、あと、そうですね。まあ、結構あれなんですよ。あの、もしかすると、こう、オプスで言って、えー、すごく原理主義的で、なんか厳格なのかと、あの、いうような、まあ、考えもその世の中にあると思うんですけれども、まあ、まあ、ある意味、味その原理主義的っていうか、厳格なところはあると思うんですけれども、まあ、ただ現実的に、あの日本みたいなところでは、えーまあ、私の妻もあのちょっと講演で話しましたけれども、えー、私の妻もあのカトリックの洗礼を受けてないですし、えーまあ、そういった環境でこう現実的に、えーまあ、信仰をどう生きるべきかというようなことも、えー、教えられですね。でまあ、それからその周りに教えを伝えるときに、こうなんていうんですかね。な,なんかやっぱり周りの様子を見て、あのー、まあ、言うべきことははっきり言うけれども、そのまあ、現実的にこうカ,トカトリック文化はそれほどこう一般的でない日本のようなところでは、えー、あれなんですよね、そのティーチ・バイ・エグザンプルって言いますけれども、そのまあ、態度でこう示すというようなことも大事であるとかですね、まあ、まあ、そういう。その現実的なあの、まあ、教えというのが、私としてはあの結構貴重、えー、かなとあの思います。はい。はい、Professor, we've, we've、um, hit the time wall, unfortunately.、Mm-hmm. So、uh, thank, you, uh, thank you very, very much for your presentation today.、Uh, thank、It's、you very much. Great, It's great pleasure to have met with you. I hope to meet you again very soon. And discuss further、um, some ideas we, we had during test time.、Uh, mm-hmm. But again,、uh, thank you very much.、Uh, we appreciate it very much. And、um, uh, have a nice、uh, Advent and Christmas、uh, celebration. Thank you. And thank you all. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. 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 Thank you.